Okay, so when, when electrons or when atoms share, they're not going to share as nicely as we would like. There's a property of the elements. Every atom has a particular property. It's called an electronegativity. Okay, and it, I'm going to abbreviate electronegativity with EN in a lot of these notes, just so you know that EN is electronegativity. What this is, is discovered by Linus Pauling, and what he found is that electrons don't share all with the same strength. Now, even think about this. We know this about the elements. Fluorine is a very, very small atom, so therefore it's going to have a very good, it's going to do a very good job of pulling electrons. So if I have a bond between hydrogen and fluorine, okay, and hydrogen and let's say iodine. Well, notice the difference in electronegativity. Fluorine is going to have a very high electronegativity. Iodine is a very low electronegativity. Why? Because the energy levels increase and the electrons get further and further away from the nucleus. Notice we're in the bonding chapter, but we have to use quantum mechanics and everything we did in atomic structure to make sense of this stuff. So in this single bond, what's going to happen is electrons are going to be shared, but they're not going to be shared evenly. Right, because there's there's two electrons in this bond. Hydrogen pulls them because there is a pull there, 2.1, but fluorine is a lot better. So hydrogen is going to take the electrons for a little bit, but fluorine gets them a lot more. So where are we most likely going to find those electrons? We're going to find those on the fluorine, and then this hydrogen is going to be positively charged. Okay, now it's not a full charge, not like sodium that lost the electron completely and chlorine that will gain the electron completely. That's different. Notice here, look at 0 0.9 versus 3. It's a bigger difference. These here are going to completely lose electrons. Hydrogen doesn't completely lose it. It's actually pretty good at pulling it and kind of creates this bond here. So this is the bond, the fact that they're kind of sharing these electrons a little bit. So what we do is we use this little symbol here. It's a lowercase delta symbol, and it looks just like this, and it means partial means partial charge. In this case, a partial positive charge is what we're going to get here. All right. Now, if we do the same thing for iodine and hydrogen, you're going to get the same thing. You're going to build up a negativity here. But look at the difference, 2.5, 2.4. It's not going to be very dramatic. Fluorine is huge. You're going to have a lot of those electrons. Iodine gets it a little bit. So it's going to have a very small partial charge, very small partial charge. You can't even see it so small. All right, so that is due to electrons. So we're finding that when they create these bonds, these bonds aren't really truly covalent anymore. They're actually what are called polar covalent. Polar means that they have a positive and a negative end. Magnets are polar. The Earth is polar. It has a North Pole and a South Pole. Magnets have a positive and a negative side. So anything that's positive or negative is polar. Ionic bonds are polar, but they're extremely polar. I mean, polar to the max. That sounded pretty lame. Uh, re really, really polar. Whereas these are kind of not very polar and then getting more and more polar. Okay? So that's due to differences in electronegativities. So we have different kinds of covalent bonding. Nonpolar and polar covalent bonding. Nonpolar is when the two elements are the same. So if hydrogen is bonded to itself, well, its electronegativity is the same. So therefore, they're both pulling with the same force. So therefore, zero charge, right? There's no, nobody's pulling with a greater force, so therefore it evens out. Same thing with oxygen. We'll talk more about the double bond later, but it evens out. So for your diatomics, those seven special diatomics, they are nonpolar covalent bonding. Polar fo covalent bonding comes in whenever the atoms are different. So sulfur and oxygen. Well, which one's going to pull with a greater force? Well, sulfur is here, oxygen is here. Now, we have a periodic trend, which I failed to mention earlier, on the periodic table. As I move from left to right, electronegativity increases. So you might want to put this on your periodic table. I could probably spell that. Uh, increases as we go from left to right. So we get an increase in electronegativity. And as we go down, the electronegativity decreases. Okay, so we can quickly figure out which elements are better at pulling based on where they're at. Oxygen's higher up, it's going to be better at pulling electrons. So what I can do is I can say, okay, since the electron is being pulled towards the oxygen, I can draw something called a dipole moment. I'm going to define this in a little bit. But the electrons are drawn more towards the oxygen, so we would say it's partially negative, partially positive we would have a polar bond. Here there is no partial polarity because of the fact that they're both zero and zero. 
Okay, same thing with uh, nitrogen and oxygen. Well, let's look at the periodic table and see where they're at. Nitrogen is further to the left, oxygen is further to the right, increases ionization at electronegativity, so therefore we see the same thing, pull towards the right, partial positive, partial negative. Okay, so we end up with polar covalent bonds. They're kind of like in between ionic bonds and covalent bonds. And most of the bonds you're going to see are polar covalent. So how do we define, how do we determine what type of bond we have? What is the bond type? Ionic, molecular, I'm sorry, ionic, covalent, or truly covalent. Uh, so we got ionic, polar covalent, covalent. So how do we figure this out? Well, it's based on the difference in electronegativities. Now, if I gave you the chart, I would have you figure out the difference between the elements. I'm most likely not, no, I'm not going to do that. Well, we might do some problems in class like that. On tests and quizzes, I am not going to have you follow it quantitatively. This is the way we're going to do this. It's metals and nonmetals. It's where the rule comes in. Because if you look at the periodic table, if we jump back one more time, notice most of the metals are very, very low in electronegativity. Very, very high in electronegativity on the nonmetals. So we put these two against each other, we're going to always have a transfer of electrons. Hence why two nonmetals coming together is going to form a covalent bond or polar covalent bond. And metals and nonmetals form those ionic bonds. Now, is this 100% true? No, there's some times where this doesn't work, but for us, we're not going to worry about it. Now, if it happens to be two nonmetals and they're the same atom, then we would say it's a truly covalent bond. If they're two different atoms, polar covalent. So for you guys, it's going to be pretty simple. If I gave you carbon and uh, phosphorus, well, what is that going to be? Well, they're two nonmetals, so right away it's going to be covalent. Now, the question is, is it polar covalent? Well, if two atoms are different, then yes, this is going to be polar covalent. Now you could look up the values and kind of figure out where it is based on the range, but I wouldn't really bother doing that. All right, I believe this should be our last slide for today. It's those dipole moments that I had mentioned earlier. All we do is you go back and we're going to put those charges on. So if you look at phosphorus and oxygen, okay, if you look on your periodic table, let's jump back one more time here again, phosphorus is here, oxygen's here. So as you move up and to the right, electronegativity goes up. So therefore, what we're doing is we're going to draw a dipole moment. Now, a dipole moment is an arrow pointing toward the more negative element. So we're going to draw this underneath the bonds. We're going to use this quite a bit in the later on down the road, so don't just overlook this stuff. So we're going to have a partial negative and a partial positive. What this is telling me is that the electrons are moving more towards the oxygen than they are towards the phosphorus. Why? Because electrons, the, the pull of the nucleus of oxygen is greater than the pull of the phosphorus. So we get a net push of electrons in this direction. So if we were to say, where are the electrons most likely going to be? They're going to be somewhere on the oxygen more than they would the phosphorus. And that's what we call dipole moment. So dipole moment is just drawn and going in the direction towards the negative element. So for boron and fluorine, I'm going to tell you right now, fluorine is always going to win. I know a lot of these I've been drawing have been pointing to the right. That's not always the case. It's not always going to be that way. So partial positive, partial negative, and that would be dipole moments. All right. I'm sure you're going to have a lot of questions, and we will work on them tomorrow in class. Um, I hope that helps get you started, and I will see you guys later.